So Dr. Rank. <laughs> so when I think about Dr. Rank, um, oh, the flannel's it's, coming off. It's getting serious now. It's a good thing this is an audio-only podcast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> a little racist. <clears throat> so obviously this is a very thematically heavy play. But as someone who, as a writer, in my, my strongest emphasis is always storytelling. And so when I think about Dr. Rank, I think if he was cut from the story, it would be the same. So not that he's not important, but just plot-wise, he doesn't really affect very much. Like there's no major plot points that hinge on him. Yeah, he doesn't really affect any change in the story. So what is the significance of him? Which I don't ask in a cynical way, which like... But legitimately, like, what, what, what is, what is his significance? Uh, okay, I think. Well, first of all, okay. tell us, tell us who Doctor Rank is. Doctor Rank is a doctor. Okay. He is um, the Helmers' oldest, closest friend. He comes to see them every day. He's good friends with Torvald, and he often also just likes to visit with Nora, um, and in many ways. Like, Torvald kind of represents the affectionate side of marriage, and Dr. Rink kind of represents the vulnerable friendship side of marriage, I think. Nora shares everything with him. Yeah. He also, he doesn't have any family mm-hmm. of his own, and he, he himself, as the name might indicate, he himself is ill from what we can presume to be, well, that his father had contracted some kind of illness because of his own promiscuity and that he inherited this illness at birth. That's what we know. And with a name like Dr. Rank, um, there's a sense, right, of this rotting, that there's something, that he is this manifestation of this something rotten, culturally. Is that his name in the original play? Is that a translation? That is his name. Okay. So, so in... Something that we talked about with the actor who played Dr. Rank, Michael Adenek, we, this November round, really um, started to, to explore that, that I think it's, one way to think about Dr. Rank is that he is this other, other emblem of the patriarchy at work, right? That he, he also loves Nora, but potentially in a, in a superficial kind of way, and particularly in the in the scene where she's dancing and they're just very voyeuristically <laughs> watching her, um, it's creepy and it's really uncomfortable. But also, I I think Dr. Rank is an example of of how a patriarchal system and a system that takes advantage of women hasn't worked out for him. Okay. He very literally yeah. has has been diseased by it. Yeah. Has, doesn't have a family of his own, so he's this sort of, you know, third wheel all the time. You know, he he also can't quite find a comfortable place in a society because he isn't married, and yeah, any number any number of of ways in which he he to me represents the downsides <laughs> of patriarchy. That even as a man, he himself hasn't benefited very well. I think it's interesting too. Nora, in her conversation with Christine, talks about this fantasy she has, right? That some admirer will will all of his wealth to her and this debt will go away. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that solution actually presents itself. We have this amazing scene between Rank and Nora where she is wrestling with whether or not to ask him for the money. And he spoils it. <laughs> <laughs> By incidentally confessing his love for her, so this is this always makes for that scene in particular makes for interesting discussions in class. But what what kind of gets concluded is we're presented with an opportunity to see Nora come up against a moral boundary that she will not transgress the boundary of of respecting her marriage to Torvald. So as soon as Rank turns it into a situation about romantic love, she can't ask him for help anymore. When they were friends, Mm -hmm. she could bring herself to do that. 
when he was going to die anyway, not have any family to inherit it, why shouldn't it be his best friend? But once it's romantic, Nora won't go there. And it showed, it reveals something about Nora's moral fiber. It's interesting that that it reveals something about her moral fiber because she doesn't want to compromise her marriage. But then that, that attitude seems to change towards the end. Because, well, and I think it alludes to some of the things that she said before, prior to the play. Like, I think she refers to the, the whole situation of, of Torvald finding out about the debt and all these things. Uh, she refers to it as, as the most wonderful thing is about to happen. And so it's kind of the white knight thing. She's about to be rescued. Things are about to play out how, how they are supposed to. Right? But then I think in between in between that time and the time she decides to leave, she kind of has this realization that, well, no. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's not how things are going to play out. And I think also it sort of reveals her, you know, what her priorities are again. Like, keeping together her marriage is less important than her responsibility to herself as a person, but more important than accepting money in a way that to her seems like infidelity. Um, I have the script open to this this scene you were talking about, so because I think this is one of those those lines with the double meaning. So tell me if I'm right. It's when um, he's talking about <laughs> he's, into a game. <laughs> any one of them. Any he's, one of them. He's talking about line, he's talking about his me. father, and he says, "My poor innocent spine, it seems, must pay the price for my father's rather jolly days in the army." Nor says he was rather partial to asparagus and pâté de foie gras, was he not? Absolutely he was, and truffles. Nor says, yes, truffles and oysters too, I believe. Oh God, yes, oysters. He was <laughs> deeply partial to the occasional oyster, was my father. Yeah, those are all innuendos. Yeah, yeah they're not talking about... <laughs> they're not talking about, about oysters. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dan was like, my innocence. <laughs> Guys, I don't think I could be a part of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, uh, at least my initial impression of the relationship between Dr. Rank and Nora is that um, Dr. Rank engages with her on a more serious level, right? I think because, I mean, you said that um, it was kind of another outworking of the patriarchy, right? Like, the, the the unhealthiness of a relationship between a man and a woman. And um, I guess I kind of perceived the opposite. I perceived that, well, maybe Dr. Rank, I think, maybe does see her more as an individual. I agree. Yeah. A little bit. That doesn't mean he's perfect, but I think that the marriage, a marriage for, a hypothetical marriage between Dr. Rank and Nora would not have turned out the same way as one between Nora and Torvald, mm -hmm. even though they're within the same context, within the same traditions mm -hmm. and ex expectations and things like that yeah i agree with that and i, I think a, a very common theme in ibsen's writing is the question what makes a marriage so we see a brother and a sister who have more of a marriage so to speak than that brother and his wife in one play mm -hmm. um he's very preoccupied with that like actually what is it to live in a kind of bond with another human being that is that is a partnership and a deep caring for one another. So he, I think Ibsen and his plays like to give us pictures of that that are actually outside the institution of marriage to contrast them um, and, and help play, paint that picture of you know, an institution for institution's sake versus for the sake of the people it ought to serve results in unpleasant outcomes. I think it's interesting in that that same scene when he sort of confesses his love for her, he says, I'm afraid I was under the illusion that you enjoyed being with me as much as you enjoyed being with her with your husband. And she says, but that's true, I do. That's not an illusion at all. Which is interesting because her entire relationship with Torvald is an illusion. And so she's found this person who, in her mind, she only relates to as a friend, but she 
does it, she doesn't have to have all this pretense around him like she does around her husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then extends that comparison to hanging yeah. out with the maids yeah. in the maids' quarters <laughs> versus being with her father. Of course I loved my father, but he was my father. And I had to be perfect for him all the time and obedient and conform to his sense of who I should be. And with the maids, I can cut loose. And she, I, I just love that, <laughs> that little peek into Nora's yeah. <laughs> past and that picture of, of how, you know, you can basically overlay her relationship with her father um, and her relationship with her husband. Yeah, which she makes a lot more explicit mm-hmm. at the end of the play as well. All right, we want to talk about favorite moments here. Sure, you seem like you have one. I do have one. This is the, this is the one I wrote down right when I got home, and it had to do a little bit with blocking, which we haven't really talked about too much, and how that can communicate things in play. It's it's when um, Nora and Krogstad. I think it's it's Krogstad's second or third visit, or something like that. And it seems that it's kind of when they kind of have this interchange where Krogstad says, "Do you realize what you've done? You know, legally speaking." What you did was no worse than me. And um, I think there's a moment where Nora kind of realizes the gravity of the situation she's in. And she sits down on the couch, right? Just kind of out of exasperation. And then what Krogstad does, the way you blocked it, or someone, I don't know. I don't know if you guys have a little bit of liberty with that at all during production or anything like that, too. Isn't that something Cody just did? Mm -hmm. He he knelt down. Mm -hmm and faced her and was kind of a mirror image of her. So you could see you sitting on the couch and then him kind of right across from you, same level, both look like you're kind of sitting. And I had this thought and I, I mean, plays mean all sorts of different things to all sorts of different people. So who knows if my, what I say has any relevance, but um, uh, it was kind of like there were mirror images of each other. And the only thing that separated them was time, right? Because they did the same thing. They, legally speaking, they forged signatures, they did something that brought Krogstad into a huge amount of disrepute. And uh, Nora was kind of, it's kind of like Nora was on her way down the downhill slide and Krogstad was at the bottom. So the only thing that separated them was time. And it was kind of like you looking in a mirror into the thing which you fear becoming the most, right? And seeing that you're not so much different. The only mm-hmm. thing that's separating you is you going down this certain trajectory. Mm-hmm. But... Nora changes that um, by the end of the play and kind of whether she cares about it or not or or what that outcome is. So I just thought that the way that that was set up was profound to me. Well, that's really interesting because talking about Christine sort of saving Krogstad, because when you think about those two relationships, you think Nora and Christine and Torvald and Krogstad, but then you compare Nora and Krogstad in Krogstad, like I said, sort of, Christine came and saved him. And that's what got him out of that. And then Nora's in a similar situation where, she, like you said, she's done the same thing. And Torvald doesn't. Mm-hmm. So there's there's another contrast. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of contrasts <laughs> in this. Yeah, but, the, 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 yeah, definitely the main thing that came to my mind, and I like I said, I don't even know if this is a theme, but, you know, kind of what is that thing or what is that person that you fear the most about yourself, right? Or what you fear becoming. And um, kind of the message of, you know, sometimes that's closer than you think, mm-hmm. right? That you're, how, how you, what you do after you commit a certain thing, how you choose to behave um, afterwards, the next decisions you make determine a lot of, of what, you, what you become or, or what you're trying to avoid at the mm-hmm. same time. So whoever did that, hats <laughs> off to them. Yeah, you know? I think that was a choice Cody made yeah. in a scene where he was working with a certain approach in that scene and made that choice. And I was like, keep it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't change it. Um, so did you guys see kind of the same thing I was? Or was what did you say to keep it for a different reason? No, I th- well, a lot of it is really intuitive. And we're working so fast that I don't always stop and go, now why did I like that? Yeah. But as you're... As you're talking about, it, I think that's that's def- that's the I think the willingness of Krogstad to look her eye to eye and to see himself and her, and then also for Nora to see herself and him. I think we're all a lot closer to our downfall than we realize when we live on such a tenuous, you know, tightrope walk that society asks. 
so we did we did some of in the blocking there was quite a bit of that right them mm -hmm. squared off or them on the same plane or drawing a, a distinct line between the two of them that they would close in on or um, yeah there was a lot of a lot of the stage pictures that was trying to underscore that feeling yeah I think something too with that moment was what he's saying to Nora then he starts talking about like I know that you're thinking about committing suicide mm -hmm. and I've been there and I know you won't do it so it's also this moment of, I understand you. Like, I've been in this exact position. Which and he tells her not to do it, which yeah. I think is so, it's almost this. He's like getting down, like, and like, I'm caring for you, kind of. Well, I mean, we've talked about how he, he only is, is doing the things he's doing because of this situation he's in. Not because he's, you know, an, an evil kind of guy. And so I get the sense that he he really needs this money and he really needs this job. And so he's going to do whatever it takes to get that. And unfortunately, that involves pressuring and, you know, bullying Nora. But he's aware of that. And I think he feels bad about it. Yeah. Yeah. And when I when I talked to Cody after the after the production, and I said, "Hey, this is what I was getting from your character, like exactly what you said. Someone who's isolated from their from their actions. They don't really like it, but they know it's what they have to take." And Cody's like, "That's exactly what I was going for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for saying that." <clears throat> and so I mean, yeah, yeah, that was that was the two things that I wrote down that stuck out to me was the blocking with that scene and <laughs> and, uh, and and Cody's character definitely. Yeah, I think he probably heard a lot or I overheard a lot of him being told you were so scary you were so intimidating and and that's a little disappointing right as an actor right if that's all your audience was picking up on they think they're giving you some kind of badge uh, but really if that's all they saw then then all yeah. that work that yeah. Cody's doing to make build a nuanced yeah. person um, yeah it wasn't picked up on by everyone and yes it was cool to see because me, me and Cody went to the same high school and we were in plays together and things like that. So it, whenever I go through the line and shake his hand, I always, we always, I always uh, do the little thing where we grab each other's <laughs> forearms because me and him were in, uh, uh, gosh, what, what, Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. And I was, I was Tevye and he was, uh, at the time, he was, uh, he was Laser Wolf. The butcher. So we got to sing to life, to life, to high end together and Jack drunk and things like that. And so that's when I was a senior in high school and he was a sophomore. Wow. So yeah, that's a, it's, it's cool to see, uh, you know, people um, continue on with those sorts of things. Yeah. He does the work. Mm -hmm. Do you have a moment, Tanner? I wouldn't say I have a like specific moment, but one thing that I thought was pretty cool was there was a, a part of the in the first act where they were talking and everything and like I had this thought and I was like this the way this dialogue is structured and presented sounds a lot like Wes Anderson which is a good thing because Wes Anderson's amazing but um, <laughs> it's like very storybookish and almost like rehearsed and not in the way like you memorize the lines and don't present it well it's like this is a conversation that the characters have every day and it's very routine for them but then as you get farther into the play there's like more pauses it felt like and that the dialogue was slower a little bit and it was like we're actually having these real conversations not just this conversation we have all the time you know Getting so I thought uncharted territory yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah it's like well I have to actually think what I'm saying not just put on autopilot mm -hmm. so I thought yeah. that was one of my favorite things about it like in this opening scene, when it's just like, I'm trying to work in here. I know. I'm sorry. Has my little hamster been spending all of my money again? Not all of it. Did you buy all this? Is that very bad? It's a little bit bad. Not terribly bad. And it's just like, bang, 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 like bang, bang. Yeah. 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 Yes. Like, it's playful, and they're yeah. following the script, and everything's smooth as long as you follow the script. Mm -hmm. But once Nora starts to go, wait a minute, who wrote this thing anyway? <laughs> um, she starts to ad lib, and it all falls to pieces. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Zach? Do you have a favorite I have, moment? I have a moment. Um, really, 
the whole ending is my favorite moment because that's the most powerful part. But um, the part that I want to talk about is um, she says, I, I need to think for myself. And she's talking about that. And Torvald says, what you're suggesting goes against every religious tenet. And she says, I don't even know what religion really is anymore. All I remember is what Pastor Hansen told me when I was confirmed. He said that religion meant this and that religion meant that. He said Jesus meant this and Jesus meant that. I need to get away from here and be on my own for a while so I can see with clarity if what he said was right. And I think that's my favorite line in the whole play, partially because of my own experience. I've gone through that exact thing. But my question... <laughs> For you guys is did you get any reaction to that particular aspect from a very religious audience I was anticipating it but it I did not myself hear specific reaction to that okay. bit of text I hear it more to, to well there's more you know, wincing at Nora's choice to leave versus those words in particular. And it might just be that, you know, words are words and they can fly by and yeah. did I hear that right or whatever. But yeah. we saw that. We saw her leave. And depending on who's in the audience, too, <laughs> I hear things afresh and I'm like, oh, ouch, I might get better about that later. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, but also, I don't think the feedback always comes to me. Right. It goes to people who might have something to do about it. Right. To get to me versus genuine, you know, collegial feedback. Right. But I, I, you know, I think watching the performance every night and hearing those words, I don't, you know, religion meant this and religion meant that. And I, it does. It just, it rings with such an intensity um, on a, a Christian college's campus. And I think what I hope is that is that everyone can say I too went through a time of needing to grow up and own my own faith I too had to question what I inherited and or if I haven't yet I need to right otherwise I don't think you can actually call yourself a Christian I think that's very evangelical right that you yourself must know and understand your own faith in order to claim it it's not just tradition and inheritance so that's what I hope is the, is how it sounds to a Christian community yeah. when Nora's saying those words. Yeah. And that's how it should. So that's my moment. Thanks. <laughs> Do you guys have any favorite moments? Yeah. That stuck out to you? I mean, Act 3, kind of, because it was just so challenging. Like, it was just so hard to do because... I don't know like once uh once dr rank leaves it's just nora and torvald for the whole end of the act and it's just like once he's out the door like as the actor on stage it was kind of like okay here we go like you really got to be in this now like this is the big i don't know i guess punch um so i just liked the end I think that was my favorite because it was so challenging and because I felt like that required the most vulnerability from me and so it pushed me to grow the most. As far as how how we staged it and how it would play out, one of my favorites is the moment I think we see Nora commit to leaving the house, which is at least as I saw it, the moment when she says, I'm going to take my costume off. We talk about layered meanings, right? She's finished performing. So we see her in her kind of room area, taking off the Tarantella costume, and Torvald in at the other end of the house, you know, basking in the glory of his ability to forgive his wife. And they're ju we just see them literally divided by that pillar that's on stage <laughs> um and having these two very you know him just cozy and comfortable and her just on the opposite end of, of that preparing 
for the most painful thing she'll do. So I that moment in particular, and I, th- I think it's just, there's something so visceral about watching Nora. It's almost like she's putting on armor, right? We're watching mm-hmm. her prepare for leaving. Mm-hmm. And I love moments like that, where we get to watch a character prepare for something they're about to do and have an interior life, a private moment, we would call it. And especially before finally making a declaration. Mm-hmm. It's very powerful. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting image when they're in separate rooms there because well, I talked about this line earlier when he says it's a it's it's a little bit like you're my wife and you've also now become my child. And so a large part of that whole that whole soliloquy that he has he's just in a room by himself. Mm. <laughs> sort of very self-congratulatory. <laughs> and he's talking to no one quite yeah, literally. And, and meanwhile, she's where he can't see her, she's changing. Uh-huh. And, and she gets to have, because he can't see her, she gets to have honest reactions. Mm-hmm. So finally, on her face, we see what she actually thinks when he says things yeah. like that. Too. But I feel like that that's sort of representative of of what's been going on this entire time is his attitude while where he can't see, you know, she's she's changing, but she's also changing as a person. Like you said, taking her costume off. But that's like that's the first time that we get to sort of see her as she really or that Torvald gets to see her as she really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think moments like that, just when I talk about Act Three having been a big challenge all these moments where like Nora is genuinely reacting and figuring things out for the first time. She comes back in the room and she says, I've been your doll. And that's the first time she's ever said that out loud. And as she's saying it, I think she's just now realizing that's true. That's what I have been. And so to have to rehearse that over and over and over again, (laughs) but then also make it fresh every time was really hard. But yeah, also fun, because everything's just so new to her. Well, I think we've squeezed a lot. (laughs) I think we have. Now I can ask any final thoughts. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Could send us into another podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so where, where can people either be able to see a production of this play or get their hands on the script? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I imagine many libraries would include a copy of of the script by various translators. And it's also online. Things like Project Gutenberg and so on will have Ibsen's works there. The Simon Stephens translation that was done by the National Theatre in London, um, there's a recorded production of that on a website called Digital Theater, spelled R-E, and for Tabor and some other educational institutions who have purchased this educational package, it's Digital Theater Plus. Um, so any, if you're at Tabor's library, for instance, you can watch it there by simply going to the website and searching for the title. Yeah, I think it's really important for people to be exposed to the actual work, you know, before during the discussion, which is why we're talking about it at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> what really what we should have done is done this after the first time you did it, mm-hmm. but it's too late. So we, yeah. Yeah. we didn't have, have a podcast, podcast back then. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and I, I think too, it's good to keep in mind, like we've just directed you to a recording of a production by a totally other production team. So yeah. they interpret the text in, in different ways than yeah. we did for our community and, and yeah, that's that's the great thing about plays, though. Mm-hmm. It's, they're different every time with every cast. All right, I guess that means there's only w- one thing left to do, and that is the joke of the week. All right, <laughs> Laurel, what's your joke of the week for All right. us? What is heavier, a ton of bricks or a ton of feathers? 
I don't know, Laurel. What is heavier? A ton of bricks or a ton of feathers? A ton of feathers. Because you then have to carry with you the weight of whatever it is you did to all those birds. (laughs) (laughs) That's that. Wow. That's as if we weren't all guilty enough <laughs> from talking about that play. The whole time. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> this has been the joke of the week. All right. So <laughs> that's a doll's house. Thank you very much to Molly and Laurel for joining us. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> we also need to work on our end game. Yeah, hey, you know what? Check out The Dog in the Woods for more content. Uh, we're on the Twitter. Oh, that's right. We are. Uh, we're on the Twitter at Dog in the Woods 15 And the Instagram. And the Instagram and the Facebook, which are both at The Dog in the Woods. And uh, if you feel like being pen pals, we have an email as well. I mean, but let's not invite people to do, do that. Yeah. Yeah. We really want emails. Yeah. You know, if right. you want if you want to send comments that are 120 characters or less. <laughs> that's pretty much what we're looking for. Yeah, Twitter then would be Yeah, basically. If you have any but didn't they just expand theirs? I like two hundred and eighty now? I don't know. I thought it was. You're gonna sound super behind when this when this that's episode comes out in the next two months. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you can contact us there if you have comments or suggestions for what we should talk about or questions relating to anything really. Yeah, yeah. that's about it. We'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.